Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Tomorrow, a coordinated day of giving to support farmers in the 413 who were affected by the frost and the floods. We're calling the day of giving Farm Stand. It's to support the Healy School Administration, who set up the Farm Resiliency Fund to offer more expedient relief through the Community Foundation of Western Mass and the United Way of Central Mass. And tomorrow on the show, we'll welcome Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll, Tim Garvin from the United Way of Central Mass, and Megan Burke from the Community Foundation of Western Mass. So get ready for that. But today on the show, a focus on two of our farms, both of whom suffered massive losses due to the weather, but both of whom are surviving by doing more than just farming. Later, we'll take you to Mike's Corn Maze in Sunderland at Warner Farm, where they're contemplating what it means to be human in an age of artificial intelligence at a corn maze. But first... The card is awesome because it's like a, it's a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle, but like this seat moves out of this way and this seat moves out of that way, and that makes it so that the I wheelchair wish, can get in. I wish the designer were here. He's such an interesting person. He lost his legs in Iraq, and um, he started a company making these. Uh, he has two versions, one that holds a wheelchair next to the driver and one that actually places the wheelchair at the steering wheel so the uh, person in the chair can drive it themselves. That's the one I need so I can make it down from my place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Park Hill Road is a challenge. I'm sure, in a chair, right? If you remember back in July on the Fabulous 413, we hosted a show in celebration of the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, where my friend Chris Palamas from Florence was giving us a history of that landmark legislation. And on the way out the door, Chris said, you know what we got to do is we got to go visit Park Hill Orchard in East Hampton because they're making what is one of the most beautiful and wonderful experiences of New England, going to an apple orchard more accessible. And what is amazing about this apple orchard, Park Hill, is that it's not just apples, it's art. And Chris, tell us about what you have just done with uh, one of the orchardists here, Russell Brain, who's locking you in. So this amazing golf cart has a wide ramp hooked off on the side. So I was able to roll up the ramp and take a little time maneuvering in a position here. And now the ramp is folded up next to me, so it gives me a solid handhold. And as we go uh, off onto the slopes of this orchard, I'll be grabbing over here for a little stability. And uh, with Russell's amazing command of the vehicle, a great tour. Russell Brain, not just a clever name, but the brains behind this operation. A relatively new farmer, but now I feel like I've known you for so long that I can't even call you that anymore. 16 years now. <laughs> but that's new. Yeah, it's still new for some of the farmers in the area. Tell us about what got you involved in becoming an orchardist. This was not your, your previous career life. You even had a, one of the very first online radio stations. Yeah. Um... Well, we were computer nerds, and we did a lot of we made a lot of web pages. Then we decided to retire. I tell young people getting into coding, write down a number and put it in your sock drawer. And when you hit that number, throw your computer away and do something else with your life. <laughs> you mean like a financial figure? <laughs> yeah. Yep. So then you decided to get into farming, which is very lucrative, and I'm sure hasn't drawn that number down at all. Farming is a crazy business. <laughs> this year, uh, of course, we lost our crop to the uh, May 17th freeze. So. Four orchards near us have pledged part of their crop to keep our farm stand stoked up with apples. So we will have apples, and we have the art show, which is all new for this year. It's the seventh biennial art in the orchard. There's uh, 33 artists involved with uh, 32 sculptures. It's quite a nice show. It's a great way to spend the afternoon, and I guarantee you that your children are going to be tired when they get back in the car. <laughs> so if you need to tucker out some children, Park Hill Orchard is where it's at. Full disclosure, underwriter of NEPM, but that's not why we're here. We're here because it's fun that not only is it apples and not only is it art, but it's accessible. It's triple A. Accessible is the A word, and we're not able to call it fully accessible because it's a farm. And we, we've made strides every one of the biennials to make it more accessible. And uh, this year, we're adding this uh, electric cart, which we're about to ride in, which I can securely strap my neighbor and friend, Chris, in, and we can go around the trail. This is a catch-all for anyone. We've brought people that never thought they would be able to get out on the farm, around the farm. And we also try and make it accessible for people who are also um, either have trouble walking or are in chairs that prefer to go around by themselves. So we've done a bit of uh, landscaping and, and shoring up of different areas so that someone could practically wheel themselves around as well. Chris, 
Palamas, you've been working on disability issues for a very long time. How rare is it to have an orchardist and an orchard and a farm take these type of strides, if you'll pardon the poor turn of phrase in regards to if you're not walking, to go this far trying to make a place like this more accessible? You know, I mean, there's been so much beautiful ingenuity in making this happen. This is the third year we have some form of golf cart. The original one was a lot funkier. It was a side sit. Last year, the big step forward was finding this much more advanced cart where we can sit more comfortably straight forward. It's remarkable. And for me, I have come bashing around these slopes in my chair over the years. Mm -hmm. And now to be able to do it here in the cart. And, and last year, with a fine apple crop, Russell was driving me as I was able to pick an apple right from where I'm sitting now. Nice. How long has it been since you were able to do that? How long? Yeah. Never. I've never had any experience like this. And to me, that's incredible. And this is also, this is our neighborhood. Judy and I live just a little bit more than a mile away. Judy works here at the farm stand. I come down here during the season four or five days a week. That's a gorgeous place to be. It is. Chris has been a font of knowledge and expertise for us. Uh, we've been making, trying to make real changes. We can't make every change that we'd like. But Chris helps us narrow it down and make sort of a triage list of the most important things that we could do that are, are practical to do. So having a neighbor like Chris has, been, has really made possible a lot of what we've done with the accessibility. We spend about a quarter of the budget uh, each biennial on accessibility. It's something we feel very important about because we are trying to share the farm with as many people as possible. It's been a real learning experience. I've learned a couple of things. One, one thing I've learned is the term disabled and handicapped aren't particularly good words, but they're the ones that we have to use. I've learned that, or I'm learning that every single person is, is different. They're a unique individual. There's no two, I'll use the word, there's no two disabled people the same. Each person is a unique fit and a unique person. I don't see people as a person in a wheelchair anymore. I see them as Chris or Bob or Martha and I try and understand what they might be thinking inside their own selves and uh, you know to some maybe they don't even feel disabled because they're just they're just folks like us that are trying to live their best life. I'm gonna go on learning about this but it's been a real enriching uh, experience to uh, try and get more access for more people. I'm sure it's not cheap. And you mentioned that some of the money towards the biennial, this art uh, program that you have in this orchard here at Park Hill in East Hampton goes towards that. But is there other funding or grants available if, if other farmers or other you know organizations that are listening and say, hey, that was inspirational to me. I want to do a little bit more or even a lot more. I'm not sure about grants, but I will tell you that so-called abled people are very generous. They see this cart going around and they want to support it. Uh, local businesses support it. Uh, you know, the banks and businesses here in East Hampton donate generously. And people uh, also contribute at the, at the door. It's, it's a free show and it's free parking. You don't actually have to spend any money here, but people are, uh, really want to help us out with this stuff. And so this cart, although expensive, uh, did not cost us any money. People, and I want to thank the people from the community. People from the community and the businesses have made this possible. You know, a lot of caregivers and family ride on this thing. So there's seat belts on every seat. We also bring a lot of people that just have trouble walking. That's been another eye-opener is how many people have trouble walking. And I have a lot of empathy for that now. And so we constantly drive this around and we pick people up and say, hey, you look like you're, you're a little winded. Do you want to ride around the rest of the trail? And often they do. So if you do come and you're on a walker or you just uh, your legs just aren't up for it, feel free to ask if you can just ride in the cart. Plus, no matter your level of ability, Riding in a golf cart is just fun, especially you know, if you're not golfing. One of the big kicks for me was when I see someone taking the ride is uh, try to catch up with them afterwards and, uh, and talk over the experience with them. And we've had just amazing stories. A, a youngsters had multiple, multiple surgeries at Children's Hospital in Boston. And before each of those surgeries, her mom brings her to the orchard. That's so great. They spend time here at the orchard before going off on some difficult medical adventure in mm. Boston. A little peace of mind, because it is, it is unbelievably gorgeous here. It's a healing place.
Up next, we'll tour the art from the accessible card at Park Hill Orchard in East Hampton. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. Well, should we go for a ride around the orchard? Absolutely. Two people want to sit here, you could also sit in the back. The back is fun. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Electric cart, so I like that too. 30% of people in chairs prefer to transfer to the seats. Uh, of course, Chris, you know, uh, is one of the ones that doesn't have that choice. But if, if people transfer from their chair to a seat, then we have room for another chair as well. That's cool. Then we watch for heads. Everyone in a chair has a different amount of strength in their neck. And so, and it is a farm, so there are uh, some bumps and stuff. So we try and uh, diagnose uh, everyone like that. Uh, well, I've always encouraged people to talk to the driver. Yeah. Let the driver know, you know, what's comfortable and workable for them. You know, if the slopes are getting a little too steep, look for a shallower slope. And this is a big cart, so we always carry at least one caregiver, and often we're able to bring the whole family together, which is very nice. We would say companion, you know, yeah. because okay. who's giving care to whom? And right now it's Russell Brain from Park Hill Orchard, Chris Palamas in his chair, strapped in nice and tight, me and Khalees all in the cart, and we have room for at least two more. Two more. Here we go. Driving in an accessible golf cart, Park Hill Orchard, East Hampton for Art in the Orchard, their biennial juried art exhibit. Stopping at art stop number one. I love this one because it just says, run up the hill. <laughs> it's the toe dancer. There are what, uh, 32 pieces this year, Sean? Sure. Sure. The one we're coming up on is metal and like handlebars. It looks like all it sorts of handlebars turned into like a sphere. Oh, not quite a sphere. It's a, a flat oh, pancake. Like a Ferris wheel. Yeah. Circle Cycle by Matt. Evald Johnson. He's a local guy from East Hampton, uh, and he's he's maybe one of our famous artists. Uh, he has a lot of work out there all over the East Coast. Now this piece right here, this giant red frame, for as long as I've been coming to Art in the Orchard, I feel like this has been here. And so some of the art goes away after the, the season, but some of it stays. So tell us about this giant red frame. So this was from the 2013 biennial, quite a while ago, 10 years ago, and we it hit such a chord. You can imagine it's one of the most photographed objects in the Pioneer Valley. It frames our Mount Tom range. Mount Tom, to some people, uh, is considered to be the uh, geological heart center of this uh, lower valley here. And, you know, it was always just here. Oh, yeah, that's Mount Tom. But this, this frame makes it into something special. We get a lot of visitors from back east. And as you drive from Boston to Tanglewood, Mount Tom is the first mountain you see that lets you know you're getting into the Berkshires and you can sort of let your, let your breath equalize. It's a requirement to take a picture here at this frame and also when you get to the Berkshires at the Solowit at Mass Mocha. I mean, like, everybody's got a picture like that sometime. I don't know about the Solowit. <laughs> this is another looking at the mountain piece. So this looks like a giant wire head painted red looking at the mountain through the eye of the beholder by Wade you, Clement. Uh, you step into that piece. Oh, oh wow. Well, That's really cool. Actually to, uh, you can get, look right through their yep, eye. Actually look through the eyes of the the sculptor's vision. Russell, you did mention that the May 17th frost decimated your apple crop. Any apples left or was it like a total loss? So in a nor we would have about 4,000 bushels this year. I think I can find about 30 or 40 bushels. Out there. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. Worse, decimated means you only lose one in 10. So this is actually ninemated. I don't know. We have about, we lost about 99%. 99%. Along with many other orchards, almost every other orchard in this area was hit at least to some extent. I don't know anybody who kept more than 30% of their crop. That's a banner year for this year, for here. Yeah, I have a t-shirt that I made. It says farming dot 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 sheesh. <laughs> <laughs> that sums it up. This piece is kinetic. It actually moves in the wind. It's called feather ball. And uh, we put it right in the middle of the pumpkin patch because people always want to walk into a pumpkin patch and see what it's like from the inside. So this gives them a chance. Wait for the great pumpkin right next to it. Yeah. I got a rock. Michael Tillier runs the, um, the Visionary Art Museum in Northampton over there by the bowling alley, and he makes wonderful art. I'm going to do this one for you. This is an interactive piece. Oh, it's called Rough by Michael Tillier. It's a doghouse, and out of the doghouse <laughs> come two paws and a pair of cymbals smashing together. I love it. I'm going to pull that one. Can I pull it? Yeah. 
there are two paws sticking out of the doghouse. And if you pull this rope, <laughs> that was rough. Oh no! It's the name of the piece. That one's really fun. It's also in the doghouse. I have a permanent piece here, which is from the uh, the Montague artist uh, John Landino, who's uh, unfortunately has passed away now. But I knew him pretty I love, well. I love that guy. I love it, this thing because it's round, and everything we make here is round, so it fits right this in. This week we call the portal to the orchard. Very often we see whole families will pass through that that portal on the way in. Nice. If they got kids, that's the magic entry. Sometimes when they leave, they jump backwards through it. <laughs> this is a giant apple corer by the Holyoke artist Peter Dellert, very accomplished artist, and he has it's such wonderful craftsmanship. You wouldn't tell it wasn't real, except it's giant. <laughs> yeah, it looks to be about six feet tall, and it's stuck right in the ground, right in front of the uh, the main base of location here at Park Hill. This is our. If we have a political piece, this would be it. It's hardly political, but it's melting icicles <laughs> hanging from a tree. <laughs> I don't need to go any further with that. And the fox and crow, which is a, a favorite of children. For what it's made out of, if you look at it closely, it's really amazing. Yeah, it looks like it's made out of metal, just hammered metal together. What, but... but like there's a saw, like there's a scythe in there, um, oh, like yeah. a razor. And like, so the pieces must be from some other working equipment. And then there's wrenches in it, wrenches for the legs. Taking all these repurposed metals and hammered them into a Real fox cool. and a crow, very cool. Oh, and forks for the raven, for the raven's feet. Another big event which we have is the Full Moon Poetry Walk, which is being uh, run this year by the Pioneer Valley Writers Guild. And we meet at uh, dusk, and this will be on the full moon on the end of September. I think it's the 29th. We'll walk around. There'll be torches at every sculpture. We light them for photographers in different ways as we walk up to them. And then people from the Writers Guild read uh, poetry and prose. It's a really um, very heartfelt event. As far as community art, it's just something that you experience and you feel good about life at the end of it. <laughs> Russell Brain from Park Hill Orchard here in East Hampton. What made you want to mix art with your orchard? Like farming is hard enough, but then you've decided you're going to figure out how to convene a jury that's going to jury these pieces of art every other year? Well, Jean-Pierre Pache runs the Big Red Frame framing shop in East Hampton in the old city hall. And he came to us early on and he said, oh my gosh, this looks just like a sculpture park that I knew of when I grew up in Switzerland. And so we agreed with him to do a sculpture show. We, it was really hard to find the sculptors because we were very unknown. And in 2011, we staged a show. It won a Gold Star Award, which I know sounds a little silly, but it's actually a prestigious award. We got limousined out to Beacon Hill to get our award from the state senate and uh, it brought a lot of attention to East Hampton. East Hampton at, when we came here was just starting to really explode into the arts. The mills had started being renovated and people realized oh this town's about art and landing this uh, statewide award made it possible for Burns Maxey and some of the other uh, artists to uh, have us designated as one of six Massachusetts cultural zones. And then subsequently, artists here in East Hampton have won three more Gold Star Awards. So we're, I don't know, I call East Hampton the Brooklyn of Western Mass. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this has just become such a center for the arts community here in East Hampton, and the arts community is exploding. It's an exciting environment. This orchard was also run down and abandoned for nearly 15 years when we came here. And every year it would lose all the leaves. It looked like... Heck. And when we started sprucing it up and bringing it back to production, I think that was a big shot in the arm for a lot of people that live out here on the countryside of, of East Hampton. Many people stopped in the driveway and said, oh, thank you, thank you for, for doing something with this place. We thought it was just going to molder over and end up burning or something, you know. So, yeah, I mean, the art show really came out of us going with the wind, you know, so, uh, smelling the cat food, as it were, that we... <laughs> <laughs> I have never heard that expression, and I need to work it into my standard vocabulary. Same. Two of our artists that have been in a lot of our shows, Chris Woodman and Dave Rothstein. Uh, Dave Rothstein is a, is a well-known snow sculptor. He's been in the international oh, yeah. competitions. I know him. He does incredible snow sculptures. Yeah. This is pretty incredible yeah. as it is. He's been working with hay recently because there hasn't been a real lot of snow. and. Uh, <sighs> 
So this is a hornet's nest and it's meant for children to go inside and you can imagine children love going inside it. And uh, there's a metal um, hornet on top of it crafted by Chris Woodman who, uh, who has done many uh, sculptures like the, uh, the space woman that's blasting off on the top of a uh, galaxy restaurant here in town. Oh, yeah. was one of his. Uh, that was also a best in show. Here's our classical art piece, the torso of a male. Mm -hmm. We gotta have a gotta have a penis in the show. <laughs> <laughs> have you had a penis in the show every during show? I, somehow or another. <laughs> and we're celebrating dinner. all bodies as we're taking a, a accessible golf cart through the Park Hill Orchard Art in the Orchard with Chris Palamas and with Russell Brain from Park Hill and Kalis and I riding in the cart along. But what intrigues me is we are rolling across towards a, towards a boat. Yes. How many people have come to me and said, how did they get a boat down here? Well, I know there's been a lot of flooding, so maybe it just washed ashore here in the orchard. You know, we're, we're hedging our bets. Yeah. So let's see. We've got the small work show on the 16th and 17th. We've got the full moon walk on the 29th of September, the full moon. When it comes up, you'll have to remember, oh, yeah, there was something to do on the full moon. It was to go to that art show. <laughs> in an orchard in East Hampton. What do you think, Chris? How did how was this experience for you in a wheelchair, in a golf cart, getting to go through this orchard and seeing all the things? Well, it's been a dream to have you guys join us here so we could <laughs> uh, put the word out about this really mm. extraordinary opportunity for a lot of folks. And we've been inviting people from the disability commissions from East Hampton and Northampton and other places mm. to come on down. And anybody you know who has difficulty walking, whether they identify as having a disability or not, um, the opportunity to um, actually schedule ahead with some of our volunteer drivers. There is a art cart scheduling hotline, and it is 413-570-5314, and a volunteer named Helen will answer the phone, and she has access to our scheduling calendar, and she can uh, verbally assure you that you will be ready to go um, we opted not to use an automated sign-up because uh, it's actually quite difficult for a lot of people to even get here. Um, sometimes it can take them hours to load up and come here, so we feel it's important to verbally talk to them and, and assure them that their appointment is solid before they, they start that effort. That's so great. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been wonderful. The art is so great. I'm so sorry about your peaches and apples. I'm glad some of the fruits survived, but the art will live on because farming Sheesh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again to Russell Brin and Chrisus Palamas for taking on a, us on an accessible tour of the art at Park Hill Orchard in East Hampton. Why was that so hard to say? It's as hard to say as it was fun. Up next, another farm thriving through agro-tourism. Mike's Corn Maze in Sunderland at Warner Farm, where they're contemplating what it means to be human in an age of artificial intelligence at a corn maze. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. We're at Warner Farm in Sunderland, the home of Mike's Maze, which I like to say is the most amazing maze maze, maybe in all of America. Homonyms again. Yeah. And I need to fully disclose that you guys are an underwriter of NEPM, but you've been my friends for a very long time. Dave Wisseman, who is the son of the uh, eponymous Mike, who farms here at Warner Farm in Sunderland and who run the Millstone Market right across the way. And then Jess Marsh Wishman, who is the wife of Dave Wissam and the daughter-in-law of Mike of Mike's Maze fame. Jess makes the maze in the corn here. Dave makes the games in the corn here. Dave makes the maze. And Jess makes the maze. Yes, spelled differently. <laughs> doesn't work as well on the radio. Yeah, that doesn't quite work on the radio. It doesn't translate to the radio quite as well, but you are 100% accurate. Every year the maze has a theme, and over the last few years the theme has been words written in the corn. So Jess Marsh Wishman, tell me some of the words that we've seen in recent years that have been here in your giant, what is it, five acre? Eight acres. Eight right. acre corn maze. I think the first word that I started with a couple years ago was vote which was in 2020, and we made uh, a game all about voting rights. It was our most educational maze to date, I would say. We were worried people were going to be turned off by how informational it was. People don't like information these days. People tend to not. I mean, yeah, there was no fake news in the maze. It was all legit. We asked people to think about really heady questions about voting rights, and people loved it, and it was so affirming for us. So we kept kind of going with bigger more philosophical themes, I would say. So the year after that, we did Imagine, 
which was a tribute to John Lennon and Yoko Ono's song. The, the year after that was slightly less philosophical, oh, yeah, but it was, but it was just, a, it was our amazing action movie maze, which was yes. so much fun. But I have it's to an say, action in the corn. Yeah, I felt like vote, imagine, action. I just liked the progression there. And then this year, the maze says thinking. That's what you see first. It's a word that comes out of the field most clearly, and it's in a pixelated style. And then you start to notice that, oh, there's something going on around the edge. It looks like a motherboard a little bit. And in the corn, carved in angular letters, it says, in the age of artificial intelligence, what makes us human? Question mark. The maze says thinking in it. That's the main thing you see first. Thinking, thinking. ellipsis. And the other thing and worth noting is you don't actually see this. You only see giant stalks of corn. You need right. a helicopter yeah. or a drone to actually see. Everyone keeps thinking that the answer to the question we're asking is thinking, and it's not. Our point is that we are thinking about this question. And in four corners of the maze, we have thinking stations where we are asking people to contemplate very philosophical questions about artificial intelligence. We are asking people to really put their thinking caps on. Oh, and you literally have thinking cap merchandise. We made, yeah, I mean, shameless plug. <laughs> shameless plug. We got a press release from UMass Amherst saying how much work they're doing in regards to the field of artificial intelligence just down the street here from Mike's Maze in Sunderland. So I hit reply to this email. We said, much like Reese's peanut butter cups, what if we combine these two great tastes together? <laughs> two great tastes that taste great together. Maybe you have a scientist from this department who wants to come through the Mike's Maze, corn maze, about artificial intelligence with us. The person responded to the email saying, this is the greatest email I've ever gotten in my life, and put me in touch with you. What's your name? Hi, I'm Scott Neekum. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science at UMass Amherst. So now we have a challenge in this corn maze to go play as many of these artificial intelligence themed games before the rolling thunder that we hear in the background <laughs> comes to get us. Oh man, those are moving fast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some would say that the advancements in artificial intelligence are doomsday, and it does feel like that is happening right now at wow. the maze with this Way thunderstorm. Way to put a fine point on it. <laughs> what kind of classes are you teaching, especially in regards to things like we're talking about today, artificial intelligence at UMass? Well, you'll be quite surprised. This semester I'm teaching an undergrad artificial intelligence course. Uh -huh. <laughs> do, the, do the students get to do all their work using chat GPT? Because my wife, who's a professor at Smith, is always having to take these conferences about how no students are allowed to use chat GPT or things like that at all, which is the artificial intelligence generator, I guess. Right? Yeah, I've been thinking more about how I want to handle that. Um, <laughs> You know, we don't do a lot of writing or things like that in my class, but we do write a lot of code. And, you know, ChatGPT certainly can generate code for students, so I do ask them to uh, not do that. But I think we're trying to find more and more ways of actually just letting students harness the power of that because these are tools they'll be using and have available to them in the future, so to empower their programming. You're teaching people how to make artificial intelligence. How to make artificial I mean, intelligence. So maybe we point. blame you if yeah. we're scared of it. No! <laughs> that's not how it works! Are you scared I mean, of it? That is kind of how it works. <laughs> <laughs> There's all these dramatic news stories. There was this incredible New York Times story about this conversation that somebody had with a beta version of one of these interactive AI bots that started to go rogue and created a new personality and was, does that stuff give you a professor who's teaching people how to make this stuff pause? Does it give you fear like the rolling thunder of doom in the background that we hear? <laughs> a lot about AI right now gives me pause. Uh, I'm not worried about, I guess, rogue AIs with crazy new personalities coming out of nowhere. But what I do worry about is that AI is moving much, much faster than virtually anybody predicted. That's where it's hard to predict where things are going to go and easy to get worried about what things might look like in, you know, three, five, ten years. How many years do you think it'll be before I can insert, like, a probe in the back of my neck and learn Kung Fu in ten minutes? <laughs> I know Kung Fu. Show me. Yeah, I, don't, I just don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> Damn it! I've been counting on All this. All of my Shadowrun dreams just dashed. The first thing that you see when you're about to walk in the entrance of the maze is a life-size computer with a big QWERTY keyboard in front of it all. We always like to make sort of larger than life props here at the maze to make it a little bit more exciting than just walking through a field of corn. All right, well, let's go in here. Okay, so we're at one of the first stations here inside the corn maze in Sunderland at Mike's Maze. In the age of artificial intelligence, what makes us human? We're going to think about it. We're thinking. First question is, can computers think? 
we're asking people to consider here some kind of really large topics like what is thinking? What are brains doing when they think? And if a machine can process information, is that not a way of thinking? So you're supposed to read a lot of dense information and then decide which yeah, There's opinion. a lot of text here in oh, this maze. This we are year. not going light. I mean, I think our maze might be more difficult than his class. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can get some credit for creating the maze, at least. You haven't read my, rate my professor reviews. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> the question, can computers think? Consider the information and options presented below and decide. Can computers actually think? Cast your vote with a marble. The debate about whether machines can think is ongoing and involves complex philosophical and ethical consideration. To answer this question, we must consider the nature of consciousness, intelligence, and the potential limits of artificial systems. Then there's a green for if computers take the green pill, if computers <laughs> can think, and the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. If this, machines can't think. This does, I'm now realizing this is a missed opportunity between the blue pill and the red pill. Oh, this is a missed It's not reference. too late to repaint. Professor Scott Neekham from UMass who teaches about artificial intelligence. If you get the marble, where do you place it in this? Oh, I get to marble. actually do it. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm going to put it in yes. Now so, I'm more scared. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am intrigued. <laughs> so it, it depends on what you mean by thought. But to me, what thought is, it is the thing that prevents us from being completely reflexive in the way that we respond to the world. You know, when something comes flying at my face and I blink, that's just automatic. You know, there's no thought involved in that or needed for that. But thought is, you know, using my model of myself and the world and projecting long term uh, what the you know consequences of my actions are going to be and how they're going to change the world and how I can create step by step plans to accomplish things. Machines are starting to do all of these things in various ways, not necessarily in a manner that at all resembles how humans do these things. But I think as a computer scientist, I think of thought as a computational process. And we are building machines that can undergo similar types of processes like that. For listeners, the thunder got louder on its own when he answered that way. <laughs> do you have chills? I have chills. It's so hot, but I still have chills. We are at Mike's Maze in Sunderland with the maze makers, Jesh Marsh Wishman and Dave Wisseman, part of the Warner Farm family here. And we are also joined by UMass professor Scott Neekham, who teaches a course in artificial intelligence, teaches about artificial intelligence at UMass. And the theme of the corn maze this year is artificial intelligence and what makes us human in the age of artificial intelligence. Where are we now, game maker? We are at our, our second thinking station, which poses the question, should computers think? Aha. First we asked if computers can think. Now consider <laughs> if they should. Option A, machines should be able to be free to think for innovation and progress, for economic competitiveness, for freedom of research. Option B, AI should be carefully regulated because of the ethical concerns, safety and accountability, bias and fairness. This is another one of those marble voting station. It looks really cool because there's an old computer monitor yeah, I was going here. To make a comment about like the station itself and how the last one looked like just a pile of circuitry and this one goes through an actual monitor and that's just wicked cool. It was really I when I heard there was going to be a computer scientist here I was a little nervous because I have dismantled many old computer monitors to make various props <laughs> in this case. Some of them were concerned might be valuable and collectible. No, is this I offensive to you? There's like a tube in here. There's, this is not useful. That's definitely not valuable. <laughs> 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 okay, so how do we vote on this one? Should computers think? Should they be free to think? Option A. Or should AI be carefully regulated? I'll vote first on this one, so as not to I'm make anybody feel pressure. Word. I'm going with regulation. Go in there, Marble! <laughs> Smacked it. Were you sure? But is yeah. that regulation for the computer itself, or is it for the people writing it, code? It really is for the people. And also, we were thinking about big tech when we wrote this question. Well, if we, I see what you're getting If we at. don't yes. regulate... You're getting at the question of, should AI, at some point, have rights? Yes, a bill of rights. We have, we have so the many Star Trek we argument. Have. There's that question in Star Wars. I mean, it's a question across the board. Asimov asked this question. Delaney asked this question. Like everybody in sci-fi who deals with robotics asks this question. Are they autonomous? Where do their rights start and end? If this question is for humans and the regulation is against humans, I vote one way. And if this question is about and for the AI, I vote a different way. Aha, uh -huh, interesting. One of the questions in the trivia game asks, what event happened in recent years that reignited the debate over the rights of robots? 
A, ChatGBT was demanding the right to vote. B, a humanoid robot was granted citizenship to Saudi Arabia. C, Roombas across the U.S. went on strike for 24 hours. <laughs> or D, the Mars rover Curiosity requested to come home. Oh, that would be so cute. But it's the Saudi Arabia yeah. one. Mostly I know that because the professor who teaches this started to nod when you said it. <laughs> nod with a grimace on my face. <laughs> but this whole thing was so painful to watch. It, it was, I can't remember, I think the, the robot's name was Sophie. And yeah, it's it this, it has much more in common with those like animatronic band members like Chuck E. Cheese that oh you remember from your childhood. Yeah. Then it really like has. The Hall of Presidents? The, the, like the, we the, should restore George Washington's rights? And, and hopefully not in a Five Night at Freddy's sort of way. <laughs> There are ghost children possessing giant robots. Technically, they're animatronics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it has much more in common with that, really, than what we had in common with, like, a chat GPT or something. And it just kind of blows my mind that they did this press release stunt sort of thing to, to draw attention. But... You obviously didn't think that that was a good move. How do you vote here in a corn maze? Yeah, so I, I actually agree with both what A and B are saying. I think machines should be free to think uh, in the sense that there is a division between how a machine accomplishes something versus what its output is. I guess I'm not so worried about what's going on internally as, you know, what the actual downstream effects are. But opinion B, AI should be carefully regulated. Uh, yes, of course, it absolutely needs to be. You know, a lot of the research that my lab does looks at, given specifications of what is acceptable and unacceptable for a system to do, how do we actually align the system to make sure that it is, first of all, aiming to optimize for the same things we want it to optimize for and actually behaves in the way that we expect it to behave. I just saw a lot of votes for A happen right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, didn't know no, don't worry about it. There's a, there's a family here playing the maze, and they, uh, they're they voting for A. They think the machine should be free to think. That's what the future thinks. Great. <laughs> there's nothing wrong An with inherent here. bias in the uh, research technology employed at this maze with kids under six. But since I have a marble in my hands and I have to pick just one, I'm going to have to go with B. It should be carefully regulated. Coming up, more corn and contemplation about what it means to be human in the age of artificial intelligence. We'll continue our tour of Mike's Maze in Sunderland. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. We are at Mike's Maze in Sunderland with the maze makers, Jesh Marsh Wishman and Dave Wissiman, part of the Warner Farm family here. And we are also joined by UMass professor Scott Neekum, who teaches about artificial intelligence at UMass and the theme of the corn maze this year is artificial intelligence and what makes us human in the age of artificial intelligence. Where to next, maze makers Dave Wisman and Jesh Mark Fishman. Thanks for doing this. Oh, here comes the rain again. Falling on my head like a memory. Just teed that one right up for her. I know. Tell me about the binary coding game and all these other monitors you have out here, Dave. So the binary coding game is designed for kids to help understand the language with which computers think, which is binary. And essentially binary, it operates on a series of zeros and ones, which is essentially whether an electrical circuit is on or off. And it's this variation in the electrical pattern, which is how you end up coding everything into a computer. Each letter in the alphabet can be translated into binary code. So you go around the maze, find all the stations, find the code, and then you have to decipher the, uh, the secret message and figure out what Mike's favorite tech toy is that he uses at the maze every single year. I can only guess. Mike. Oh, that Mike. That Mike. So the thunderclouds finally took over. If you've never seen a thunderstorm on 47 going through Sunderland, it is awe-inspiring and somewhat terrifying. But we're now we're in the kitchen because it smells yummy in here, like all the, the fried donuts and french fries and things that are <laughs> made here at the maze you in Sunderland. You smell like it when you go home. You too can smell like the kitchen at Mike's Maze. <laughs> now we're going to do some of the quiz questions about AI. And you, Professor Scott Neekum from UMass, have uh, you've already looked over these questions. How did, how did they do as farmers and artists who are putting together a quiz about AI and things? How did they do? I think they did wonderfully. And in fact, I feel like they really avoided some of my pet peeves about talking about AI. You know, you often see people talking about how deep learning systems think like people. And well, no, no, they don't. <laughs> they're, they're very, very loosely inspired by the way that, that people think, but it's a very loose connection. And so, yeah, I'm excited to go through these and uh, I think they did a wonderful job. We'll start with one that's 
slightly dry, but it's about who our maze is inspired by, and that is Alan Turing. He was sort of one of the founders of computer science in the sense that he was the first person to really formalize what computing is, and came up with this idea called the Turing machine that formalized the idea of really computing in general, uh, and also relevant to AI, came up with the Turing test, which was a way to differentiate between whether someone was talking to a real person or talking to an AI system and using that as sort of a definition of intelligence. Also really important to the queer community because yes. Alan Turing was gay and was chemically castrated by the UK. Despite the answer to this question, which I know, like only pardoned by the monarchy, I think in the past like five or six years. Yeah. Wow. It's really tragic to find out what happened to Alan Turing, who is responsible for so many incredible things, including, well, yeah, I don't want to give this question no, away. It's the answer to this question. All right, so read the question. What other groundbreaking work that we haven't mentioned yet was Turing responsible for? A, he cracked the German Enigma code, playing a critical role in the Allied victory in World War II. B, he circumnavigated the world in 80 days, acting as the inspiration for Jules Verne's famous novel. C, he built the first handheld computing device. Or D, he became a fashion icon in the tech world for his signature black turtlenecks and round rim glasses. <laughs> Everybody here knows the answer but me, but luckily you've made it in a way that makes it so that I can pretty easily <laughs> narrow it down. A, he cracked the German Enigma code, playing a critical role in the Allied victory in World War II? Yeah, he saved millions of lives. Yep. I think what we're finding in our recent mazes is that we have opted to get a little serious sometimes because we think it actually is a very interesting place to ask questions that we think people of all ages should be thinking about. There's musical questions in the maze as well. Can you distinguish between AI-generated music and human-made compositions? Listen to the provided audio samples and identify which song is by the Beatles and which one is by a bot. The Bottles. The Beatles good, and the Bottles? That's a good band name. Oh my I'm sure it's taken. Probably. about this song. I know, right? <laughs> it's better than any song I've ever written. You can't hate it. I mean, you I mean, want to almost. What's our other option? Because the sky is blue. How do we know that this wasn't written by fake Paul, who was maybe a robot after real Paul died? is when Monty reveals all the weird conspiracy theories that he has. <laughs> you only know that based on the corner of the internet you're in. <laughs> we have to come clean about something. What's that? The last question in the game that people will come upon asks, who authored this trivia game? When Dave and I set out to do this theme and make this game, we really wanted to see if we could leverage the power of AI to help us create the game and what it would be like and what it would create and what we would you know, end up with. We weren't gonna be Luddites, we weren't gonna sh totally shun it. There are some folks who say even trying or testing out these, these programs is actually ethically not a good thing to do because you're only improving them. Anyone who goes on and uses ChatGPT is helping to improve the system and it's only going to get better and better more input. Do people think that? Sure, I think some people believe that. Do you think that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I guess I want to see learning systems work better. And if more of the right types of data can help make, you know, these systems less biased, less toxic, great. Uh, if it's just going to centralize power into the hands of a few mega corporations, maybe not so great. Although there's a large debate about whether open source AI is really a good thing too. You know, many people say, well, you don't open source plans for nuclear devices. Maybe you also shouldn't open source AI. Um, but contributing some chat uh, GPT information, maybe not so bad. Okay. But so, that being said, we asked chat GPT to write a 20 question trivia game. It didn't do a great job. <laughs> do you have any examples of how bad it was? Because I still love to laugh at, at all of this for now while we can. It's not that it was bad. It was dry. It lacked humor. What it did do, though, is it became a brainstorming tool for us. 
this is a farmer, I'm an artist, we're not experts in this. So we did need, you know, we always do research in our themes and this was a research tool for us. And then we were able to take the information that it provided to us, fine tune it, switch it up, do more research in specific areas that we thought were interesting, infuse that into the questions and sprinkle it with a little dose of our classic Mike's Maze humor. Phew! If you had told me that all the questions were written by ChatGPT, I would have been sad. disappointed. We didn't want to, you know, cop out. We wanted to have an authentic experience with this technology so that we could better convey what we've learned to the people that come to the maze. We're, we're looking at an AI generated yeah, I'm also thinking painting, of like, so which is like a looks like a woman holding a pooper scooper, a giant pooper scooper on a stick that looks like a hoe and a dog with I mean, weird yeah. eyes and a cigarette or something yeah, that's planted actually, on part of a space. Just describe these and then we'll we'll frame the question here. Okay. I mean, it looks like various forms of attempting to do American Gothic with dogs. Did you get the question before? No, no. Answer, answer the question. Answer the question before we, it was asked. We we Sorry. used the uh, the AI image generation software Dolly, the open source one, and the question is, what prompt did we use to generate this set of bizarre images? Farming beagles posed for a picture. A painting of golden retrievers playing in a field. American Gothic, except with dogs instead of people. <laughs> A corn maze ruled by dogs. <laughs> well done. Truly, the eyes are terrifying. Oh, and trust us, we picked the most palatable, oh, like, no. um, child-friendly images because we were afraid of giving kids nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> I did ask Dali if it could design a corn maze, and I feel very assured in my job for at least one more year. We are here at Mike's Maze in Sunderland, Warner Farm, with the maze makers Dave Wisman and Jess Marsh Wisman the game maker and the artist, respectively, as well as UMass professor Scott Neekum, who teaches students how to design these AI and learning about the implications that we're all trying to learn about in regards to AI. Professor Scott, what is something that you are most inspired by in where AI is at right now? And then what is something that you're most terrified by? That's literally one of the questions in Out in Maze. Did we Lisa show and I are both right on top of the question. We could have helped you. Maybe we're AI. No. There are recording stations where folks are asked a question. In this case, what are your greatest hopes and your greatest fears about artificial intelligence? And they're asked to speak into a little box. And we're recording everyone's answers and we will probably listen to some of it, but also we're going to save it as a time capsule. Because wow. I think in five years, 10 years, it's going to be fascinating to look back because I think a lot will have changed in that time. But what about you and your time capsule right here, <laughs> Professor Scott? As far as what I'm excited about, it's almost a shame that things like ChatGPT and Dolly have taken up so much of the media attention around AI because really a lot of the most exciting stuff that's happening are things like DeepMind's protein folding software, AlphaFold. Mm -hmm. You know, this could completely change human health and medicine. You know, AI has so many applications that can improve human life in, in a great number of ways, but also a lot of risks. And so, you know, I think one of the things that I'm most scared of though, I already mentioned some of my fears, but it's not a lot of the common things you hear about sort of doom scenarios and stuff, although I do worry about those. It's actually, I guess, a bit of a psychological thing of as AI takes over more and more of what humans do and uh, for work and find meaningful, especially once we don't even necessarily understand the answers it's coming up with. I don't know, what's that do to us? How do we feel when we have not only been replaced, but don't even necessarily understand what our tools are doing for us anymore? Scott led us perfectly into what the final question is that people will encounter in the maze, and that is, in the age of artificial intelligence, what makes us human? Tell us what you think, record it into the little voice box, and we're going to keep those answers for posterity and look back at them at some point in the future. Thanks again to Dave Wisman and Jeff Marsh Wisman, who created Mike's Maze in Sunderland, and to UMass Computer Science Professor Scott Neekum, who specializes in artificial intelligence. Good luck with that 150-person class you're teaching there, dude. Tomorrow on the show, we'll make a farm stand, a coordinated day of giving towards the Farm Resiliency Fund that was set up by Governor Healy's office in the wake of the disastrous July floods. We'll talk to the folks administering those funds at the Community Foundation of Western Mass and at the United Way of Central Mass, and hopefully we'll talk with, well, we will be talking with Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll herself. And we'll have a rundown of the Springfield primaries with the NEPM Newsroom. They happen tomorrow, y'all. Yes. Yeah. Special thanks to Spouse. 
Happy Valley Guitar Orchestra, Erica Badu, Chibo Mato, The White Stripes, Dolly Parton, The Matrix, Don Davis, Eurythmics, The Beatles, and Daddy's Car, a song composed with artificial intelligence in the style of the Beatles, which you are listening to right now. It's pretty darn good. Thank you to the tireless Fab 413 tech team. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. We'll see you tomorrow on the Fabulous 413.